Financial Survival Network, helping you to survive and thrive in the new economy. This is the Financial Survival Network. Financial Survival Network is presented to you by Regal Assets. Buy and sell physical gold and silver through your existing retirement plan, 100% tax-free with Regal Assets. If you want to include physical gold or silver in your existing IRA or old 401k, request your free investment kit, which was recently featured in the Forbes and Smart Money Wall Street Journal magazines. Call toll-free 855-678-6620, 855-678-6620, or visit regalassets.com. It's been put that the problem is one half of the population wants to live at the expense of the other half. But in Europe, we've got the phenomena where one half of the continent wants to live at the expense of the other half of the continent. And this is important, which is why you need to hear from Alistair McLeod. He's with the Gold Money Foundation, and he's with us now to talk about this vexing and perplexing situation. Alistair, how are you? I'm very well, Kerry. Thank you very much. And I hope you are good, too. Yeah, we're hanging in. We're kind of just watching what happens in Europe and trying to figure out what effect that's going to have on all of us here. Well, don't worry. The score will be going your way at some stage, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, we've kind of uh, accepted. That, well, some of us have accepted that fact. Others believe that, like you said, uh, never underestimate the ability of the authorities to put off the inevitable. They've done pretty well putting it off so far. It's, it's years already. Yes, I, that's right. Um, and I think there's a certain amount of connivance in the markets because nobody actually wants to believe that this is finally happening. Um, I think bear markets are always like that, aren't they? You know, we, we, we sort of travel in hope and hope that the worst never happens. And But of course, when it does, then suddenly it's, it's all really rather nasty. And I think that's probably where markets are with Europe at the moment, sort of praying it's not going to happen. Right. So we... Uh... And that's what the central banks do, right? They pretty well print and pray. Uh, yes. And uh, interest is an interesting observation because the ECB has the problem that it can't actually print in the way which the Fed and the Bank of England can do. It hasn't quite got that freedom. Um, and as a result, uh, the cracks uh, in the system can't be papered over. Um, and I think, you know, if, if the ECB could print money, then uh, we wouldn't see these countries falling over. I mean, they just chuck money at it. Yeah, they just paper over the problem like we do here in the States, right? And, Absolutely. Uh, and everybody's paper, happy. Paper it with fiat money, yeah. <laughs> but life, life should be so simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And, and you have to wonder... You know, yeah, they would love to do that. That's that's what they've been aiming at, getting that power. I think a lot of what's going on now has to do with that. And yet, Germany hasn't gone gone along with it yet. And uh, it doesn't, I don't know, it looks like gradually they're getting that power, though, doesn't it? Um, yes. Uh, it's... It's interesting because uh, the ECB has finally got to the point where it can see that the politicians have no solution to this current problem. And it is charged with defending the euro. Uh, so the ECB has decided to try and ginger things up and try and get something moving. And that was the point basically behind Draghi's speech in London last week. Um, which he followed up with a non-statement yesterday, which disappointed the markets, though I see that things have bounced a bit today. Uh, there's no doubt about it that the ECB uh, is uh, very frustrated in their current uh, position. And I can imagine that when they talk with the other leaders of the central banks, you know, like Bernanke and King and so on, um, that uh, there is big, big concern um, right at the top of the central banking community about what is actually happening on the political side in Europe and what can possibly be done um, about it by the central banks, by the ECB in this case. And it's, um, there is no solution, I'm afraid. There really is no solution to it. 
Yeah, there's only three ways to get rid of the overhang of debt. And number one is to print and inflate it away. Number two is to default and pretty much negotiate it or bankrupt it away. And number three is debt forgiveness. And politically, number one is the most feasible, although it is also the most destructive. And probably from the standpoint of economic damage, probably forgiveness is the best, but it sticks in a lot of people's craws because it makes the people who played by the rules and the people who felt uh, they were doing the right thing feel like idiots because, you know, they're basically, their debts aren't getting forgiven. And that's kind of the problem with it, right? Yes, uh, what you say is undoubtedly true. Um, but when it comes to debt forgiveness, you've got the problem that uh, they still, I mean, if you look at Greece, Spain, and all the rest of them, they're still living way beyond their means. So just to forgive them the debt isn't sufficient to deal with the problem. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I really think that the problem is considerably worse than just that. And my attention on this is turning increasingly towards the currency. And I don't know if any of your listeners have looked at the euro uh, to dollar chart recently, but 120 does seem to be uh, a pretty important yeah. psychological point. Um, yes, yes, and, yeah. we've all been yeah. watching that. Yeah, absolutely. No question. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think that if we go through that, you, you know, one can – possibly see that um, there's not going to be a lot stopping it from going quite a way through it. And that gives me a thought, because if you really consider what a paper currency is, it is essentially a piece of paper which is completely worthless <laughs> other than the issuer's promise that it does have value. Yeah. Uh, now, the euro is different from other uh, fiat currencies in this regard because it's not one government, one identifiable government through its central bank that we're talking about. We're talking about 17 separate governments, half of which are bust, and the rest of which don't want to stump up the money to rescue the other half. And essentially, the more you look at the backing for the euro, you see governments sort of saying, well, you know, go and ask someone else, not me. <laughs> yeah, go <laughs> and, ask your rich uncle, Germany. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this um, is very concerning because if we break that 120 level and it looks like we're going down, you know, sort of without stopping to wherever, it does raise the question – what is the issuer's guarantee on the euro? And the more people ask that, the greater the possibility that people who use it within the eurozone, the people for whom the euro is printed, might begin to question its use. And when that happens, you have a collapse in value. And this is very, I think this is becoming an increasing possibility. Uh, as, 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 if you like, the likely outcome of uh, all the problems we, we've, we're facing. And if it happens, it's going to be a very major, major event. I mean, you know, it's, it's not as if um, uh, we can sort of just sit there and say, well, oh, dear, what a pity, how tough on them. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to affect all of us. It really is. So this is something I think we need to monitor very, very carefully. And I think we need to go back to our textbooks and try and learn a bit about um, what these paper currencies really are. Yeah, Jim Sinclair once said that a dollar is an I owe you nothing and a euro is a who owes you nothing because nobody stands behind that currency. There's no country. You don't really know. Like, there's nothing backing it. It's, it's the, pure, the purest fiat currency in the respect there is a central bank that, uh, that's at the whim of all the other central banks. It, it's kind of interesting when you really – analyze what that's about jim sinclair is being very um perceptive i think in that comment i would agree with it entirely yeah so which leads us what's the next phase in the collapse and the ongoing collapse because i think we're there now the thing as always is look at the bond yields um Today, we've had a big bounce in the euro. We've had uh, a fall off in the bond yields. I think I'm right in saying that the 
uh, Spanish government debt, ten-year debt is down now to um, have a quick look. I think it's down to uh, about yeah six point eight four, having been up well over seven percent yesterday on uh, Draghi's um, you know sort of do nothing speech. Um, I think if we see that, you know, if you see that going up uh, again, which I expect it will, um, <laughs> if not, if not today, yeah. I mean, we've we, we, we've got bare closing and all sorts of funny things going on. And remember, these are all horribly manipulated markets. Wow. But yeah. I think if we see, if we if we do see the bond yields start rising, I think that's the clearest indicator that things are uh, coming horribly unstuck quite rapidly. Yeah, I think you are correct in that assessment there. <laughs> I mean, I, to, to my mind, um, you know, Spain's uh, insolvency is 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 fact. Uh, really, what we're talking about is not questioning facts. What we're talking about is recognition in the markets, and that's why you've got to look at how that how the market progresses in recognizing these facts, which we already know. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of obvious what's going to happen here, but like you say, they're they're in the process of denying it. They're doing everything in their power to make sure that it doesn't happen, but we all know what's going to happen here. I don't see any way out of it. I mean, do you? Uh, no, I don't think there is any uh, any way out of it. And, um, you know, I mentioned the creditors just now. I mean, broadly, that's Germany, Finland, Holland, Luxembourg, and possibly Austria. And the biggest by far, obviously, Germany. Uh, the Finns are interesting because... They are Scandinavians first and they're Europeans second. I mean, they're relatively late comers to this party. Uh, and if they look at their fellow Scandinavians, you have Norway, who's not even a member of the European Union. Mm. Um, you have uh, Denmark and Sweden, both of which have retained their own currencies. The one country that has joined the Eurozone in Scandinavia is Finland, and her experience is turning out to be less and less happy. <laughs> and I can see the political pressures building. I mean, already, you know, whenever Greece wants another bailout or anyone wants a bailout and, if, you know, Finland turns around and says, OK, well, we will go along with our share of the EFSF, but only on condition you give us extra collateral. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, they're not playing the game in the way uh, which those with a greater commitment to the Eurozone are playing it. And this makes me think that... If anyone's going to leave this in disgust or before it gets too much worse, it's probably going to be Finland. And probably more importantly, I think that the, um, you know, the, the, the stories going around the market as things deteriorate will probably devolve not so much on Germany leaving, but other countries like you know, Finland um, getting fed up with the situation and finding, you know, because you see the other thing that's, that's, that's happening in this, and this is why it's such an impasse, it's the sheer cost of the thing. It, it, in, in terms of Germany, I was talking to Philip Bagus the other day, who is a German economist, German-based economist, born in, sorry, based in Madrid. So, you know, he, he's, he's in the thick of it. Uh, and he was saying that he reckons that the cost to Germany is so far, and from what they can see, including target two imbalances, is four times Germany's tax revenues. Now, oh that's, the equiv you know, that's the equivalent, Kerry, uh, next year of going to the electorate and saying, um, you know, here we are, we've got a problem. And by the way, it's, it means that we're going to have to tax you more than 100% of your income in order to resolve it. And that's the scale of the situation. It mm -hmm. really is very, very difficult. And I, you know, this is why there is actually no solution to it. Because, you know, that's the problem now is, you know, if you, if you throw four times uh, the t Germany's tax revenues at the problem now, what's going to happen next year? Another four times? And the year after that? You know, yeah. it's, it's, uh, there comes a point where you have to call a halt to it. And uh, I think, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Germany, t uh, you know, agreeing in secret with Finland. Look, you know, we've got to do something about this. Um, because of our history, we can't back out. But, you know, why don't you? Yeah. And perhaps the thing might fall apart. We could all get out while we've got something to salvage. You I know, don't know. Put us out of our misery, right? <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I honestly don't know. But, I mean, the situation is so intractable 
that um, uh, you know it's just going to break. There is no other uh, solution, and this is why I'm very very worried about this situation over the euro. Because if the euro, if the euro's um, you know the issuer's promise um, <laughs> is, yeah, whatever, is questions, whatever it is, <laughs> whatever it is, whichever issuer, and so on, and uh, you know that then becomes very serious, and the collapse in the currency could happen very very quickly. I'm not just talking twenty percent off. I'm talking it could be complete. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a scary thing, and I think what you're describing is they're losing control. And it's harder and harder to put off the day of reckoning, as it's been called so much in every publication, kicking the can down the road. I would say it's kind of like uh, parasailing with a ripped parachute. It's only going to keep you up for so long, and then you're going to go crashing into the rocks, and that's it. It's over, and we're getting closer to that day. It doesn't. Things bad things don't usually happen in the summer. It usually happens in the fall because nobody really wants to deal with anything major in the summer, especially in Europe. You guys uh, get a month off or whatever. Not you personally. You're a hard worker. I'm a hard worker. But the rest of the Europeans are, you know, and and Australians forget about it because they take like 12 weeks off. I mean, they've got the art of the vacation down to an exact precise science, but nobody wants to deal with anything in the summer. And think about it, like how many deals can you really get done in the summer? It's very difficult for a lot of reasons because the lawyers are gone, the accountants are gone, and you can't get anybody in a room at the same time. So my guess is they're going to put it off until, until the fall, and then something is going to have to happen. And you think it's massive coordinated QE where they just pump out $25 trillion at once or – do they finally just throw in the towel and say, all right, it was a bad science project and it's time to clean the mess up? Nobody's going to throw in the towel. Um, that is for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. And uh, the ECB is banned from, uh, you know, the uh, quantitative easing type um, uh, uh, methods. Um, I don't know. They're going to have to find something. And But, the, you know, the, the cost of the thing is just getting – too much. The problem is that it's all very well saying, okay, ECB, go and print three, four, five trillion or whatever. But then you've got the problem. It just deals with the current situation. It pays some of the bills which are outstanding in devalued currency. Um, but it doesn't deal with the problem because next year they're back for exactly the same. I mean, look at Greece. Um, yeah. And I, I hear what you're saying about the summer months, but what they're going to have to contend with if they going to put it on hold is the fact the bills are just not being paid. Um, and, you know, people tell me that uh, in Athens, for example, uh, the only people who are really um, working for no salary are people like doctors who feel that uh, they've got a duty to do it. But, you know, doctors, school teachers, all the rest, they haven't been paid. There isn't any money. And the same is true in Spain, too, particularly in the regions. And, of course, that started to come out of the woodwork with Regions saying, you know, help, we need money. Um, they really do. They haven't, you know, they haven't been able to pay electricity bills and all those things. And of course, you know, they're having power cuts. Um, it is, it is a mess. You, you know, the time is against you when you haven't got money to pay the bills. Uh, you can't wait until the autumn to go bankrupt. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So, if you know, um, if 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 it is going to get delayed over the summer months, then someone's going to have to come up with some money just by that little bit of time. The Fed will print up some money, and uh, that'll be that. Uh, you know, it, it's reminding me like uh, the old Soviet Union, and when you hear these bureaucrats don't get paid for months and months, there's no salary, and they they keep working because what else are they going to do? Uh, do they just stay home and demonstrate? So they keep working, and they know that eventually they'll get paid. And whether they do or not, that's another story. And whether their pensions get paid and their lifetime free medical benefits. I'm trying to explain that here in the States because we're not as far along in certain ways as is Europe, but they just don't want to hear about it. No, I think that's that's right. Um, I, I mean, I, personally, I just can't imagine uh, – turning up for work uh, for month after month for not getting paid. Um, I hear what you're saying because, uh, you know, in a sort of 
I suppose a government a government department or something like that. You fear that if you don't turn up, um, then you're going to get sacked. Um, but you know, so it's you're on a hiding to nothing, whichever way. It's very very difficult. I have huge sympathy for these people. Yeah, well, you know, it they really don't have a choice. It's like the army; they don't get paid, but are they not going to show up? Yeah, it's it's a real tough decision and. In the end, they believe that they're going to be taken care of because what choice is there? But I don't think they'll get as much as as they were hoping for. If they're lucky, they'll get enough to get by on. But, you know, if uh, if not, you know, the, this is the stuff that revolutions are made of, right? Uh, that's right. No, that's absolutely right. Um, there is another aspect of this, which is, um, I think, interesting, Kerry, which I'd just like to float over your listeners. Um, if we assume that I am right, and uh, I, I hope I am wrong, and that is that uh, the euro faces collapse, then uh, we've got to think about what uh, is going to happen after that. And uh, I think the one thing I do see is that bond markets elsewhere, for example, the U.S. Treasuries, the U.K. gilt market, and um, I suppose the Japanese JGBs are wildly overpriced, uh, not so much re uh, relative to the existing rates of price inflation, but certainly in relation to the quantities of money that are being produced and the inflation that is implied, stored up, if you like, in that fact. So bond markets are in a bubble, and we've got to think about uh, the capital flows post-euro collapse um, and how they're likely to be affected. And I would have thought that um, the willingness of foreign money to support some of these bond markets is going to start diminishing in appetite quite rapidly. I suspect that the dollar is not first in line for this because that's a reserve currency – could be that sterling is is um, foundable on this this score, mm -hmm. and that's going to create some sort of fairly significant shifts. Um, I think it will be good for precious metals, but that's you know overall a negative, obviously. Um, and uh, I suspect that sterling could come off quite sharply. You could see the uh, yields on um, uh, government bonds here effectively being popped and uh, you know rising quite rapidly. Um, and the question then is, uh, you know, would it spread to other currencies? And at some stage, it will probably start hitting the dollar. So the, it's, it is going to be a very different world after the demise of the euro, if, um, if that is actually what happens. And we need to start thinking of those consequences. And there is another aspect which uh, I think is interesting, because if the euro does fall apart in the manner in which I described, it is going to be a huge, great educational process for central bankers elsewhere. And I think that um, they are going to begin to think through the ramifications of a loss of a paper currency uh, and will then understand that this is considerably more serious than missing the supposed benefits that the Keynesians believe um, are missing because there's not enough reflation, that, you know, the, the currency is too high, there's not enough inflation, whatever. Um, I think there could well come a point where they sort of have to choose um, not between inflation and deflation, but um, are we going to have a currency at all? And when you start thinking in those terms about the threat to a fiat currency because suddenly its value can disappear for reasons beyond the central banker's control, it might, it might just get them thinking that actually a sound money policy is something that we ought to consider and something we ought to follow. Now, if they do that, there will be lots of bankruptcies, but it will be a good thing because the world will continue. And it'll purge the system out, get rid of the debt, and put us back on a sound footing for future growth. And Abs absolutely. And, uh, you know, I may well be um, indulging in wishful thinking here, um, but, ju but just but let me do that for a moment because <laughs> I, I totally I, agree with you because they're running out of options. Yes, exactly. And what what particularly concerns me is the cavalier attitude of central bankers towards the sort of very fragile flower that is a fiat currency. They abuse it. Um, they abuse it in a way which tells me they don't actually understanding, understand the pricing dynamics 
behind fiat currencies and what gives them any value at all. And I think the point about uh, the issuer's um, promise being questioned in the case of the euro uh, is going to be a big educational um, experience, I think, for us all, and particularly the central bankers, who then will be start thinking about, you know, what happens if it happens to us? Um, and yeah. hopefully that will concentrate some minds. We can only hope. And yeah, what the central bankers forget, and we've had a relatively, I don't want to say stable, but controlled burn for the past four decades since Nixon close the gold window things have been crazy but they haven't gone this close to collapse so these central bankers forget or they ignore the fact that these fiat currencies only exist because of confidence in the people using them and that once that confidence is gone it's a very difficult thing to ever get back and in fact you don't get it back once it's gone it's gone period Absolutely. And uh, I, th I would look at this period since uh, the Nixon shock as really one of, of lulling central bankers into a sense of full security about their own currencies. Yep, totally. So, Alistair, on that note, we got to get going. We find you on the Gold Money Foundation and on financeandeconomics.org. Anything interesting coming up in the near future? Um, well, I continue to write. Um, I think pro probably the, the my regular writing really is a weekly 500 word um, uh, article for Gold Money, um, which I also put on my own site. My own site's being rehashed at the moment. That's financeandeconomics.org. Right. Um, so I'm not doing anything on that just for the moment. And once that's back and redesigned and looking really beautiful, then uh, I'll start <laughs> posting separate articles on that. But at the moment, goldmoney.com, and if you link through to research, you'll find me in there. And that's a, that's a, weekly, uh, a weekly thing I do. And I think it goes up every, every Sunday night now. Yeah, we, so we you, post you regularly on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Uh, and people can also hear this interview and previous interviews we've done. Yeah, I'm looking at goldmoney-foundation slash home and off of uh, goldmoney.com. We see you there. And essay. This weekend, yeah. my article will be about this issue as promise. So, um, you know, if your listeners want to sort of tack in and sort of try and work out a bit more about what we're talking about today, then uh, that might be an opportunity for them. All right. We will definitely post your article and a link back to the site once it comes out. Alistair, as always, thank you so much for being on FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com. We'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Maybe sooner if, uh, if it really starts hitting the fan. Well, it's, um, thank you very much, Kerry. Um, I'm always delighted to talk to you. So, you know, just pick up the phone and I'm here. All right. You be well. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> 